On the day that China is sending global markets lower, we're joined by a special guest and a renowned China expert, Iswar Prasad, senior professor at Cornell and senior fellow at the Brookings Institution. Uh, professor Prasad is also former head of IMF's China division. Good afternoon, Professor Prasad. Uh, fabulous to have you on the show, especially today since we've had such a string of bad news come in from China, uh, some change in its collateral policy, which doesn't allow for high-yield bonds to be used as collateral in some loan uh, we've seen that have an impact on the yuan, which is headed for its possibly single day biggest loss, you know, since 2008. Rates have moved up in China uh, and growth continues to be the big puzzle. What do you make of what's going on in China right now? The Chinese government is trying to strike this very fine balance where they want to maintain growth momentum even as it is slowing, continue with their financial market and uh, um, broader financial sector reforms and at the same time not go back to the playbook they had back in 2008-2009 during the financial crisis when they had this explosion of credit which helps support economic growth but is having very negative ramifications to this day. So the move taken by the Chinese government today sort of indicates the tensions that they face. What they're trying to do is some, let the air out of the housing bubble very slowly, try to make sure that there isn't too much fraud in financial markets, while at the same time trying to make sure that there is enough credit to support economic activity. But they don't want to do it with this broad-based expansion of credit, but do it with very targeted instruments. And this is a very tricky balancing act. And today, what they've been trying to do clearly is set off tremors, both in China and in the rest of the world. But it's going to be a hard slog for China, just dealing with what they've come in with since the last uh, uh, five years. So, Ishwar, you spoke about both the uh, financial market and the, the real estate market. They're both areas of challenge for China. You, do you think they'll be able to come out of this uh, successfully? I've always been amazed at how the Chinese have managed to uh, get through this difficult balancing act. But right now, it's a very fraught issue because there is a huge amount of credit outstanding in the economy. And although credit growth has slowed, it's still growing at about 2 to 3 percentage points above nominal GDP growth, which is about 9 to 10 percent, and credit is growing at about 13 percent. So in some sense, the problem is still growing. Now, what they've tried to do, rather than increase credit expansion significantly, is to use very targeted measures that try to direct credit to parts of the economy that can generate more employment growth in particular. But that means that they have to go back to the old uh, ways of working, which is telling banks how much to lend and who to lend it to. They've been trying very hard to get away from this, but it's not been very easy to manage. The housing market is much better under control than it was even a few months ago. They managed to let some air out of it. In the first tier and second tier cities, the very large cities, it's less of an imbalance right now. But the third tier cities, the smaller ones, where there is a lot of um, uh, overcapacity in the housing sector, that is the real concern because now there is a lot of excess capacity and they're trying to manage the decline in prices, but at the same time there is a lack of affordable housing in those very cities. So it's a conundrum that they've not been able to solve very effectively yet. Uh, Professor Prasad, you know, the Chinese government set its GDP target for this year. It's 2014 at 7.5%. Uh, many people believe that they will make it to 7.5% by the end of the year tally. Uh, the expectation is that the growth target for next year will be a lower one at 7%. Now, you know, depending on how much faith you put in the data coming out of China, uh, what does that 7% really mean, not just for China, but more importantly, for a global economy that's uh, suffering, you know, a a potential recession in the Eurozone, Japan still sort of trying to get its act together. What will 7% growth for China mean? Now, China has been the biggest contributor to global growth since the financial crisis because uh, the U.S. economy is certainly picking up a lot of momentum right now, uh, but the Chinese economy, despite a, a bit of a loss in momentum recently, is still a very fast grower, and China has become very important in many markets around the world, especially when you look at commodities. China drives commodity demand at the margin around the world. Um, what is important is not whether China will get to the 7 or 7.5% 7 next year. I'm almost certain they will because they have a lot of space in terms of monetary and fiscal policies. The big question is how do they get there? If they get there as a part of the process of rebalancing the economy so that it's more consumption driven, it's going to be better for China and for the world in the long run. 
If they do it through, again, a burst of investment that is fueled by credit expansion, that's not good for China, and that's not going to be good for the world in the long run. In the short run, actually, it may provide some degree of support to commodity demand, which is very important to many emerging markets, but also some small advanced economies like Canada and Australia, which export a lot of commodities. But ultimately, this will mean a lot more excess capacity in China, and the only way they can grow out of that is by exporting all this excess capacity, and there are already concerns that China may be exporting deflation to the rest of the world. And given that many countries in the world, especially Europe and Japan, are already facing deflationary pressures, it's certainly not helpful. So how China gets to this number of 7%, I think, is going to be the real crucial question in the year ahead. Okay. Yeah, you, you've you know, sort of given us a couple of cases or scenarios with regards to commodities. I'm going to ask you a few more questions about that, broadly speaking, and then specifically to crude. Uh, many people believe we are at the bottom of a commodity down cycle. Uh, or, or would, where would you put us in terms of a commodity down cycle across the world? Of course, given what China is up to, but otherwise as well. Well, it's largely demand-driven at this stage because there doesn't seem to be that much of a change in the supply. To take a commodity like oil, uh, it's clear that OPEC is not going to be able to get together and cut supply a lot. We've had the shale gas revolution, especially in the U.S., affecting supply uh, in the U.S., but also certain other countries like the U.K. So it's really a demand-driven phenomenon right now. And in terms of demand, right now what we look around, what we see as we look around the world, is patches of weakness practically everywhere except for the U.S., which is, uh, seems to be having uh, an increasingly strong recovery. China, where there is a bit of a loss of gro growth momentum, but it's still a fast-growing economy. And India, where there is some potential upside. But other than that, most of the other emerging markets like Brazil, Russia, South Africa are in fairly dire straits. Europe and Japan are facing a very dangerous deflationary environment. So if you look for strength around the world, other than the U.S. and China and to some extent India, it's hard to see much of the sign of strength. So I suspect we're going to see continued softness in commodity markets uh, for some time to come. What is the negative impact of continuing softness in crude oil prices especially, sir? Again, this depends on the country we're talking about. Uh, for a number of countries around the world, especially those in the Middle East uh, um, and quite a few other countries that are oil exporters, it's going to be very difficult in terms of managing both fiscal balances and current account balances. India, I think, is one of the countries that it's uh, going to benefit in a variety of dimensions because it benefits our fiscal balance, it benefits the current account balance, it's going to help with the inflation. So it's very hard to see any negatives for India. In the U.S., for instance, it's a very mixed bag. Um, in the U.S., of course, um, uh, the fact that you now have oil prices declining makes shale gas a little less competitive. Um, but on net, it's a bit of a plus for the U.S. because it does leave a lot more purchasing power in the hands of consumers, which means that the U.S. is still going to have strong consumption demand. Um, but around the world, this is, I think, a, a sign of economic softness. So in that sense, oil prices are falling, which is a good thing uh, in many uh, senses. But why it's falling is certainly not a good harbinger of what lies ahead for the world economic recovery. So if we are, we, we are cheering in India at $65 a barrel, at what point should we start getting concerned? Well, India is not that dependent on foreign demand. So I guess for India right now, if oil goes to uh, 65 or even slightly lower, it's not a big negative. But it does imply that there is going to be a lot of uh, uh, weakness in external demand. And um, countries in Latin America, uh, like Venezuela, which already have a very difficult uh, situation, uh, emerging markets like Russia, and of course the Middle Eastern countries, plus uh, some of the European economies like the UK and Norway, uh, that rely on oil exports to a significant extent are going to be facing fairly difficult situations. This will affect their budgets and their um, current account balances, which in turn will affect their consumption demand. So a softness in consumption demand is ultimately not good for anybody in the world, including India. So I think there is a, a point at which falling oil prices are not going to be a net plus uh, even for India. I don't think we're quite there yet, but we're pretty close.
Okay, before we talk to you in a little bit more detail about India, Professor Prasad, can you talk us through what your assessment is of the current trouble in the Eurozone as well as in Japan? Uh, you know, uh, how badly off are both these regions and are they likely to be able to get their act together in the next year or so? Uh, maybe Japan, yes, but the Eurozone? It's going to be a very difficult and challenging time for both of these uh, economic areas. Uh, in Japan, um, Prime Minister Abe did seem to be ready to unleash his three arrows, which is monetary policy, fiscal policy, as well as uh, structural reforms to get the labor and product markets working much more efficiently. But Japan faces this much deeper background problem of very unfavorable demographics with a declining population, and a declining labor force, and that's going to be very difficult to deal with. But I think the reality that Japan faces right now is that they are still relying on monetary policy, uh, which is uh, um, the Bank of Japan essentially uh, printing more money, buying more assets. But this is going to have very limited traction in an economy where the supply side is not working very well. So ultimately, unless Japan can undertake some of these structural reforms, such as getting more women in the labor force, freeing up uh, uh, competition in certain product markets, it's going to be difficult for Japan to fight the deflationary trap. Europe faces a similar situation right now, uh, and I think this is sort of endemic of uh, many advanced economies around the world. This excessive reliance on central banks in order to do all the heavy lifting in terms of supporting growth. In the Eurozone, there has been a lot of progress, even in the periphery countries, in terms of freeing up labor and product markets. There has been pro uh, progress in terms of bank restructuring and in terms of moving forward in banking uh, union. But the reality that Europe again faces is that debt burdens, uh, public debt burdens in particular, are still very high. The financial system is not generating much credit. Uh, business and consumer confidence is at very low levels. So ultimately, you're going to need a combination of all three policies, fiscal stimulus, monetary stimulus, and structural reforms working together in order to lift Europe out of its deflationary trap. And right now, the reality again is that it's monetary policy that's doing most of the hard work, and that's not a good recipe for long-term growth. If you're in your book, The Dollar Trap, you say that the dollar is, will remain the predominant currency for a long time to come, and not so much because of the strength of the U.S. economy, but because of the weakness around the world. That was about, uh, I think it's six, seven months since you wrote that book. Are you surprised since then at the strength of the U.S. economy, and what's your uh, outlook there? Well, in some sense, it's always nice to see the thesis of one's book validated, and that certainly happened. Now, the U.S. is a fundamentally very resilient and dynamic economy, and it seems to spring back to life because it's a very flexible economy. Now, not everything is perfect in the U.S. It's true that the economy has been generating more than 200,000 net non-farm payroll jobs every month uh, for uh, well over a year right now. The unemployment rate is well below 6% right now, but these are not very high quality jobs. If you look at median wages, they haven't risen much at all in the last few years. So it's a very mixed picture. But again, this is a very dynamic economy. And as I argue in the book, it's not just economic size, it's not just dynamism and the depth of financial markets, but also institutions, including a legal framework, a democratic system of government, and the central bank that the world seems to be willing to trust. And right now, all of that is being aided by the divergent business cycle conditions of U.S. versus other major advanced economies. The U.S. Uh, is already discussing when they're going to start tightening monetary policy because the economy is doing very well. Although we haven't seen any wage or inflationary pressures pick up yet, in most of the rest of the world, we're talking about easing monetary policy. So right now, the dollar strength is being reinforced, not just by these safe haven considerations, but also the divergent cyclical positions of the U.S. and the rest of the world. Do you expect, Professor Prasad, that uh, the tightening in U.S. monetary policy, uh, you know, or the withdrawal of the Fed, if you may want to call it that, uh, will begin in the middle of next year? And will that mean, I mean, you know, is the Fed behind the curve at all? Or do you think that they waited long enough for a degree of robustness to come back to the U.S. economy before moving ahead? It's a very difficult time uh, for the Fed right now because many indicators, including what's happening in terms of employment, the unemployment rate, GDP growth, all suggest 
that they should not only be withdrawing um, their quantitative easing operations, but perhaps think about aggressive uh, tightening. But on the other hand, if you start looking at the inflation numbers, there is absolutely no indication of tightness in the labor market translating into wage pressures or into inflationary pressures. And of course, the external environment looks very weak. Now, right now, the fact that there is talk about the U.S. tightening sometime next year, perhaps in the latter half of next year, has kept the dollar very strong, which is good for the rest of the world, because the yen, the euro, and many other currencies have been depreciating against the U.S. dollar. But there is a limit to which the U.S. dollar can sustain appreciation against practically every other currency. The U.S. is not a very open economy, very dependent on trade. So a strong dollar through cheap imports, um, and through keeping inflation down may actually give the U.S. some more room to string out its monetary policy. So the Fed is caught in this very difficult bind that the asset market pressures are probably there. There is some degree of frothiness in asset markets, but those two have tamped down in the last uh, uh, few months. So I think the Fed is waiting uh, to see some signs of a pickup in inflationary pressures, either in terms of long bond yields or in terms of inflationary expectations. And the funny thing is, it's not happening. So there is no good reason for the Fed to move. But I think um, if the labor market continues to deliver such strong performance, they will end up having to pull the trigger. And I'm sure once they start pulling the trigger, they will do so uh, in fairly aggressive manner to make sure that inflation stays under control. But right now, even in the U.S., the talk is really about concerns about disinflation. There is inflation slowing down rather than picking up. So the Fed seems to be in no hurry to act. But I know that the Fed officials are very concerned about it, what you mentioned, about getting behind the curve. So any signs of a pickup in wage or inflationary pressures, I, will, I think we will see some action but, coming. But are you saying, Professor Prasad, that if they do in fact start raising rates, uh, and you know, I, I, you're saying they might do it aggressively, uh, you know, successively as after the first ra raise, but many people in fact anticipate that it might be uh, fairly minimal and long drawn out. Uh, but if they do start raising rates in the second half of next year, they will in fact be ahead of the curve and not behind the curve, especially given the inflation data of the past? It's hard to see, again, a strong case for the Fed uh, um, tightening very much. So my anticipation is that they will be able to hold off uh, a little longer. But again, it largely depends on what happens with inflation. If they start tightening without inflationary pressures becoming very apparent, then I think they have more room to uh, go with gradual moves. But the uh, uh, scenario where inflation expectations shift somewhat abruptly, given the amount of liquidity in the economy, given the amount of strength in the economy, they might start moving somewhat more aggressively. I don't think that's a very likely scenario right now. I think a much more likely scenario is a gradual tightening starting sometime towards the end of next year again, unless we have a string of very positive or very negative news. And right now, the betting seems to be that we're going to see more positive than negative news coming out of the U.S., Okay, I have a quick last question on central bank policy before we get to the India bit of the interview. And that is, how do you see the contrasting forces in terms of central bank policies that will play out next year? You may have the Fed pulling back. You'll have the ECB diving into probably the purchase of sovereign bonds in Europe. And everybody's trying to figure out how that one will work. Uh, Japan's uh, monetary policy will continue on the easy path. China might continue, you know, uh, with the loose monetary policy, so to speak. How, how will all of this work? Uh, and, and what will it mean for emerging markets like India? For an emerging market like India, the one thing that one can be certain of is there is going to be an enormous amount of volatility in currency and uh, um, currency markets and in terms of capital flows. Now, you have correctly pointed out that uh, the um, uh, business cycle conditions and therefore the anticipated monetary conditions of the major central banks are going in very different directions with the U.S. at one end and virtually every other central bank moving towards the direction of easing. How they ease, what sort of uh, assets they buy, of course, um, is going to be very de uh, dependent on which central bank you're talking about. But already we have a bank like the Bank of Japan doing things that would have seemed inconceivable almost a few years ago for the uh, BOJ to actually be stepping in, not only buying uh, Japanese government bonds, but also stepping directly into asset markets, including equities. But that's, uh, I think, symptomatic of how much the central bank is being relied upon to um, pull both financial markets and economic growth back on track. 
The European Central Bank, of course, is a much, in a much more complicated political environment, but if um, deflationary pressures continue in Europe and um, the core Eurozone economies, especially Germany, France and Italy, continue to show negative growth or essentially zero growth, I don't see how the ECB can hold back much longer. So the notion that the ECB has managed to get a lot of traction through its words without having to uh, employ many actions, I think, uh, uh, is no longer going to be feasible. They're going to act, uh, uh, have to act very aggressively. The Chinese central bank will almost certainly continue with a set of targeted interventions, but I think they may also start moving towards a broader easing, perhaps by reducing the reserve requirement on banks, how much reserves they need to hold at the central bank. So this is all going to lead to a lot of volatility in currency markets, and that I think poses some concerns for uh, an emerging market like India, because it could get caught in this whiplash of capital flows around the world. All right. So that brings us to India. And I, I want to get your assessment of what you've seen in terms of action by the Modi government so far. Are you disappointed that maybe we haven't really seen, uh, you know, a full blueprint of what this government intends to do uh, and not really big reform measures? Are you pinning your hopes on the budget next year? What do you make of the fact that it's going to be a stretch to meet the fiscal deficit given the low tax collections, uh, you know, the, the delay in the disinvestment process? Where do we stand in the Indian economy right now? I was certainly more hopeful that we would see a big package of reforms early on in the Modi government. Um, I was hopeful we'd see much more aggressive action in terms of some reforms that are clearly needed to put India on a, um, a higher growth path for the long term. We haven't seen that, but I think there is some method to the temerity the more I think about it. Because what Mr. Modi seems to be trying to do is make it clear that he's going to get some basic building blocks that are necessary for the economy to work well. The first is macroeconomic stability. The Modi government has been reasonably supportive of the Reserve Bank of India in terms of controlling inflation. Um, it's been fairly um, um, uh, careful in terms of fiscal policy to make sure that we stay on track in terms of reducing the deficit and debt levels, although it's certainly becoming more of a challenge to maintain that path. So macroeconomic stability is essential before you can start talking about structural reforms taking root. In addition, what Mr. Modi seems to be focusing on is good governance, getting the government to work better, dealing with certain issues like corruption, and frankly issues like sanitation that might not seem to be on the uh, uh, front burner of the reform agenda, but are really important in a couple of dimensions. Number one, of course, they have very important implications for women's dignity and uh, health more generally, but in addition, I think they are very important in terms of creating the narrative that any reforms the government undertakes are going to benefit the masses. In a country like India or China, I think it's a reasonable narrative sometimes that the benefits of economic reforms are largely going to go to the economic and political elite. So getting this message out that these reforms are really going to benefit the masses is very important. If you take the notion of financial inclusion, giving a greater part of the population access to uh, formal financial markets, that again is something that spread the benefits of growth more broadly. So I think it helps to convey the message that the reforms are to benefit the masses. But having said all that, I think it would certainly be good to see much more aggressive action in terms of disinvestment, in terms of labor market reforms, in terms of changing the subsidy regime. In all these areas, I certainly see progress. And I think the notion of devolving some of the um, uh, reform agenda to the states, getting a state like Rajasthan to move forward with labor market reforms and perhaps to build from what we learn at the state level, there is certainly some... Um, uh, Professor Prasad, uh, forgive that. me for but interrupting you, but is all of this, at least in the near term, especially because we are having a slightly more near term conversation right now, going to help India sort of uh, shield itself or deal with the volatility that you've anticipated next year? So I'm just trying to get a better sense of India's economics six months out. Uh, you know, are we in a better place to deal with any of this volatility? And since this is the last 30, 40 seconds we have on the interview, I'd like a quick comment from you as well on what you make of the RBI's position on inflation and therefore its, uh, you know, decision not to cut rates in its last monetary policy meeting. It's very important for the Reserve Bank of India to focus on its core objective, which is uh, fighting inflation. 
and I think it's much too early to declare success in the fight against inflation. So that is the biggest goal uh, that the Reserve Bank of India uh, has. And in terms of its ability to support growth, we need macroeconomic stability from there. I think what India has done in the last uh, um, year or so has given us a lot more protection from external uh, shocks. The current account balance is down. We have a larger level of reserves. The rupee, I think, is at a reasonable level, and there is some more room for uh, movement around there. So I think we're reasonably protected from external shocks, but we need a lot more momentum in terms of getting the economy going and back on track to a high growth path. All right. Yeah, you're saying there's room for a further depreciation in the rupee? I think a mild depreciation in the rupee right now will not hurt us very much if um, there was a pressure in terms of capital outflows, if uh, the Fed were to tighten. Uh, I don't think that will add that much to inflationary pressures, and I think the economy can take it. Falling oil prices have certainly been a big boon in that context. All right. Professor Prasad, we'll have to leave it there. Thank you so much for joining us.